You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. For the community, by the community. For the community, by the community. Welcome to Cooks and Books. I'm Sarah Connor and I will be your host for the evening. This evening's chef is the co-owner of Metro Beast Restaurant in Simsbury, Connecticut. He's seen regularly on NBC 30 and is heard regularly on Faith Middleton's Food Schmooze on WNPR. Chris Prosperi. Hi everybody. Chris, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, we're, I feel like I'm a little bit with a rock star. You know, we, see, know. we see and hear you all over the place yeah. in Connecticut. So tell us a little bit about how you became um, to kind of be this well-known chef in the area. I don't know. You know, it didn't start out to be in the plan of what we were doing. Um, I'm originally from New York City, and my family is from New York City. And in the 70s, everyone in our neighborhood was uh, finding summer homes to, you know, to get out of the city, right? My parents got us all in the car in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, and they started driving every weekend, and they started driving out and looking for, looking for a summer home, and ended up in Litchfield County. My father retired early, um, and that's when we moved full-time up to Connecticut. I was a fresh uh, junior in high school. My parents are both in the restaurant business. My dad's a pastry chef, my mom was a restaurant manager in New York City. Mm. So I'm from a family of restaurant people, so of course as a kid, the one thing I wanted to do was not be in the restaurant business. <laughs> so I, like any normal high school student, went to see my high school guidance counselor, um, who, who didn't really know me because I'd only been in the school for a year, and uh, he said, let me see your scores. I guess it was my SAT scores. <laughs> And he said, oh, you did really well in math. You should be an engineer. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. So again, I was like, OK, that's not, uh, that has nothing to do with the restaurant business. <laughs> that's yeah. what I am. I'm an engineer. So I went to the University of Connecticut for electrical engineering, which is crazy. So you graduated as an electrical engineer? Yeah, no. See, no. that's the bad thing. We don't oh. talk about, we don't oh, talk about this at home. I didn't um, know that. Because, because <laughs> just before graduation, a semester before graduation, I decided that's not what I wanted to do. What happened was I got into a car accident and I ruined a brand new car and I didn't want to go back and get another car, brand new car so I wanted to get a job. My brother who had already become a chef was working at a restaurant in Connecticut on Lake Waramog. Do you know where that is? On, right? In Litchfield County. So he was, he was a sh one of the chefs at the Inn on Lake Waramog which isn't even there anymore. But anyway, it's this great restaurant that was there for a long time. and. Uh, as any college kid, what do you do when you need money? You go work in a restaurant. So, and again, I don't want to be in the restaurant business. I just need some quick cash. So he put me in, uh, got me a job in the dining room because I didn't want to be in the kitchen. And uh, I ran the buffet, which means I took the food out of the kitchen for the Saturday night and Sunday morning buffets. I brought the food from the kitchen to the dining room. Very easy job, very low <laughs> maintenance. And you make a lot of money doing it. So, uh, and then one Sunday morning, the omelet guy, remember the brunches where they had a guy with a big hat yep. and then he'd flip omelets in the dining mm -hmm. room? He did in the, what we call in the restaurant business is a no call, no show. Um, so it's five minutes before showtime and the kitchen's running around freaking out because the omelets guy isn't there. And I'm doing my job bringing the food to the dining right. room. <laughs> and my brother looks across the kitchen at me. Yeah, right? <laughs> Yeah, you can they already see they have the hat as they're running towards me. Oh, no. <laughs> and he says, you can make omelets. And again, I didn't know the guy hadn't shown up yet. I was just doing my job. And I'm like, so? And he goes, that wasn't a question. I'm like, OK. <laughs> he goes, you're going to make omelets. I'm like, what do you mean, make omelets? So he put me in a chef coat. I went out in the dining room. I made omelets. And that was it. So I went from University of Connecticut. Um, and then I went to the Culinary Institute. Um, Fast forward, I was in New Milford, Connecticut, running uh, a f my brother's friend's restaurant, and 
it was, we took it from the size of Metro Beast now, which is 60 seats, and I was very aggressive with him, and we took it to, um, we ended up with two restaurants, one 200 seats in Litchfield, one 140 seats in New Milford, and then a catering facility in the Litchfield property that was over 200 seats, and then another catering facility in Torrington, which is over 200 seats. So we got really big, really fast, and I hated my job <laughs> because I was running this company and it was just a little too much and it got so big and I missed that first restaurant that he started in which was the 60 seat bistro where he knew all his customers and his staff became part of his family and we started just doing like my parents did when they came to Connecticut we just did a circle around Litchfield and we just got <laughs> made the circle a little bit bigger a little bit bigger and we found Metro Beast which was already a restaurant was it called Metro Beast it was called Metro Beast it? oh, and it's, it's does anyone know why it's a cool story no. So Claude, does anyone know the old owners of Metro Beast? Claude and Kathy? Okay, so Claude, a Frenchman, and Claude's family refurbished, they were a construction outfit in Paris, and they got the contract to refurbish the Paris Metro. And if you've been to Metro Beast, where the banquette is, that's an original Paris Metro sliding glass door. And then the lights, you see those funky, blown, hand-blown glass lanterns? Those are from the station. And then the huh. bench, that curved bench that's in the front is from an old Paris metro station. Well, but the, so that's where metro came from. And Beast, everyone thinks it's short for Beast, or we let them say that. But Beast is actually when you're at a, a, um, a play or a theater or whatever in France, Encore is Beast. So you, um, if you've ever, mm. right? So that's what they say for Encore, Beast, Beast. Metro Kitchen was their first restaurant in Granby. And Metro Beast was the Encore, their second oh. restaurant. And your business partner is your wife? Yep. Yes. The boss. The boss. Mm -hmm. The boss. <laughs> we like it when our husbands <laughs> call us the boss. <laughs> um, so you have a very interesting cookbook choice. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure anyone could guess what this cookbook choice is. Never. I don't think so. Is everybody interested in seeing what the cookbook is? And, and he has two versions, the original and the updated version. Uh, it's my Bible. It's his Bible, yeah. I'm hearing Joy of Cooking over here. Any other guesses? Oh, see, I didn't. I had trouble with Joy of Cooking. <laughs> Fanny Farmer, anyone else? Oh, good one, but I do like that Betty one. Betty Crocker. Now, see, all these anyone books, else? I did not understand until I read this one. Okay. On food and cooking, the science and lore of the kitchen. And Harold McGee is my mentor. He is the... Which is funny because he's not a chef whatsoever. He doesn't even, he can cook a little bit, but not <laughs> like a chef, you know. It, but what he is is a scientist. So it's really a chef's science textbook? How would you describe it? Yeah, well, the original version is definitely a science cooking book. So it's the science of cooking. In the newer version, he's made it more approachable. He uses English. In the original mm -hmm. one, not so much, because even for yeah. an engineer and a science-minded person, I mean, it's difficult to get through because it is a textbook. But it's a great reference, and the new one is fantastic for mm -hmm. if you've ever had trouble making mashed potatoes or pie dough. Really? No one? Really? really no yeah. one? <laughs> Anyone ever had trouble? I still, I read pie the dough. pie dough section 15 times, yeah. and I still, but I can now make pie dough. Would you call it a cookbook? I don't, in the traditional sense of the word, it's really not a cookbook. It's like uh, I don't a know. book on cooking or a... a I, I think it's a cookbook because it, yeah. it does more than a cookbook does. Yeah. So it's, so the it's not a recipe Uber cookbook. book. It's not a it's, recipe book. It's not a but recipe book. But it's definitely book. a cookbook because mm -hmm. it tells you... So we were talking about this earlier. A, a Fanny Farmer, Joy of Cooking, mm -hmm. tells you how to cook, but not why it happened. So if you stumbled and you followed the recipe in Joy of Cooking or whatever book or, or Brady Crocker or whatever for pie dough and something went wrong but you followed it and you just don't understand and that's what happened to me. I'm like, I'm following these recipes and it's not working the way it's supposed to. I don't understand. Then someone handed me this book and all of a sudden I'm like, that's why, it went, that's why something went wrong because I didn't do this and the recipe didn't even bring that up. A cookbook to me is a how-to. It should be right next to the plumbing books. <laughs> I wanted to read, like, I, and I did this recently. I found an old plumbing book, an instructional plumbing book, and I changed the little P-trap thing under my sink. 
and I did it perfectly with this how-to book. And I said, and I even said to everyone I, that was at the house, and I'm like, this should be, a, this is how cookbooks should be written, mm -hmm. because I didn't make one mistake. So do you, so cookbooks kind of assume you know something going into it. They assume you yes. know the different terms, and some of them have the glossary or the, you know, definitions in the back. But for someone who hasn't really cooked forever, I mean, you didn't cook yeah. really and that's And later. I think that's where the publishing world and the real world of us people mm -hmm. are, have a disconnect. They assume we know everything. Mm -hmm. You're starting with a certain background. Yeah, and, and when I started cooking, mm -hmm. and this was me, this was me starting cooking, I didn't understand any of it. And yeah. I started reading these books, even Julia Child, which at least I like Julia Child because if you made a mistake, she at least said, it's okay, go on, right? In her, <laughs> picking up like, off the floor. Yeah, and picking, yeah totally. <laughs> and I did that. I dropped stuff, and yeah. I'm like, okay, Julia picked it up, so I'm picking yeah. it up too. But you know what I mean? So at least it got you the sense of if I make a mistake, it's okay, right? right? So it made you go on. Now I think a lot of times when we make recipes, if it doesn't go out well, we blame ourselves. Like, it can't be the book. So yeah. anyway, this book, so go, going back to these types of books, and this isn't the only one. There's a guy named Robert, and we just actually had him on, the, on, on NPR, Robert Wolf, a uh, Wolk. Uh, he used to write a column f in the Washington Post, which was my favorite column ever written in the United States on food, What Einstein Told His Cook. And he has a book in the same title. Mm -hmm. And again, it's question. And this is so. This is more a science <laughs> book, textbooky kind of format. What Einstein told his cooks is actually readers' questions to him. And he's a science guy too. So he, uh, I made pie dough the other day, and this happened, and he explains why in, in what mm -hmm. Einstein told his cook. So a great book. And another one is by um, our sister newspaper in um, L.A., the L.A. Times. The food editor out there, Russ Parsons, wrote a book, How to Read a French Fry, mm -hmm. and the pastry version or the baking version, how to read a peach. Mm -hmm. And these are all great, again, resources. These books are the ones you right. take to bed, you know, and you just thumb mm -hmm. through. And this one might be a little more technical. This one's slightly intimidating. Yeah, and, and, it's, it's, a it's, little, and it is a little more technical um, than the other two. It is very science-y, oh, but, but it also is very... not as much as very... the first one. So he did a comparison. This was a 1984 oh version. I mean, it has molecule pictures in it. It has Seriously, molecule pictures in it. Technology. Well, don't you want to know what's happening? <laughs> To the, to the starch molecules when you're making mashed potatoes? <laughs> so it's you need a little to know. intimidating. <laughs> no, okay, so it is a but. little too much. So I actually, so before I came here, I compared Harold McGee's explanation for what could go wrong in mashed potatoes to Russ Parsons. And Russ Parsons, how to read a French fry. French His fry is guy. much okay. more easily read. But this is, mm -hmm. if you can get through it, you'll be an expert on making mashed potatoes or pie dough or whatever you read from him. You will be 100% on it because he goes into every detail. So how do you recommend someone use this book? So if you, would you recommend they have it as a reference saying, okay, I'm going to make pie dough and I always mess it up and then read the pie dough section? Or what do you think is the best way to yeah, approach see, this book? So not that way, because, but, no? but, it, but it can be used that way. Uh, before you make something, right? And, and, they're, and they're very short. And yeah, that's why I this mean, one's great. Very They're very long, short. But the sections are short. The sections short. are mm -hmm. short and concise. So mm -hmm. I'm going to make mashed potatoes. So page 303, mm -hmm. mashed potatoes, and it's a very yeah. short. Read that before you make it. You know, I'm going to make pie dough. Read that before you make the pie dough. So again, and then you don't have. You only have to do it once, right? Because then you right. got. Then you have it. And it's interesting to me because as you're cooking, what it does is, as every step goes on the, along the way, you go aha. Right? And it, even Makes if you've sense, made yeah. mashed potatoes or pie dough a million times over, you now make it after reading him, you now make it with a little bit more insight and knowledge about what is going on while you're making it. It's constantly changing too because what he said here is not always what he says here. And it's interesting to see. And you said it to me earlier, uh, has it changed? Right. It's not changed so much as we've discovered. Right? So that's a science end, right? So in science, there's new discoveries which change our view of things, right? And the same thing in cooking. A good example is, um, without getting too technical, uh, grilling steaks. And try this next summer, okay? So in this book, grilling steaks, really high heat, right? Uh, the grill should be 600 degrees and flames going everywhere, which is the way I like to cook. <laughs> um, it's exciting. It's exciting. It's a man kind of <laughs> cooking thing. Okay? And that's the best way to cook a steak in 1987. 
Mm -hmm. But in 2004, what we've found, and again, we found through a, a lot of different things, maybe it's a lot of thinking while we're cooking because we have books like this, or maybe it's because in, in, in science side, on the science side, where we have technologies that show us different things. Mm -hmm. So now what he's finding, and it's true, you take a steak and you find a very cool place on your grill, and you just turn it every once in a while. So you keep mm -hmm. it turning on a very slow, a low area, and you cook it very slowly, mm -hmm. just constantly turning it. Yeah. And it barely gets charred on the outside, right? So yeah. it's n now you can almost see that it's rare all the way through from the outside to the inside. And then when you slice it, whatever done, let's say it's medium rare, it's medium rare from the outside all the way in. So he, he broke this in a gourmet article, and he used to write for gourmet, so I used to follow him. Um, and, and the day it came out, and I'm going to say it's got to be 10 years ago now, I remember having the magazine in the office and running upstairs and grabbing, we, did, we had leg of lamb on the menu at that time, <laughs> firing up the grill, and my sous chef did one really high heat and then let it rest off the side, and I just sat there and like every minute or so gave it a little turn, gave it a little turn, and then medium rare, both of them tempted sliced it, it was unbelievable the difference. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it reinvigorates you and it sort of mm -hmm. makes you excited about cooking again because that's a new thing, right? We would never have found a cool place to let a right. steak hang out. Well, and I actually read the meat section because mm -hmm. I'm very intimidated by red meat. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't, I don't cook it enough to do it well. I don't, I just, I'm just not good at mm -hmm. it. And probably because I don't know the proper way to do it. And, and he does, he talks about even just letting the meat kind of warm up so it's not super cold when you put it on the grill and then it'll cook more evenly while you're doing this constant turning. Yep. He talks about how it feels to know how it's done. He's like, you can cut it open, that's to perfectly fine. But see, I've read, I did my homework, I've read it. <laughs> it's funny because you know where he got that tip? The cutting it open or yeah, the touching? The cutting it open. Where? From us chefs. <laughs> yeah. Because. How else I mean, are you gonna everyone's know? like, oh, you guys do it just by touch. I'm like, no, I have a grill cook. He can do it just by touch because he grills hundreds of steaks a day. Not me. I don't, I'm not on the grill. So I'm, you know, sometimes I go home and grill something, and I haven't grilled a steak at the restaurant for like six months because it's not my station. I don't work over mm -hmm. there. And uh, so, even, so if I'm on the grill when he's not there, steak has two sides. And no one even knows it. So you flip it over, you make a little incision, you peek, and that's right. the side that goes down on the mashed potatoes. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> sees anything. So everyone's like, real? Like, yeah, that's how we do it. Right. Like, no chef would ever do Yeah, we all do that. That's how <laughs> I was taught. <laughs> Mike Rill can, can do it by sight. That's amazing. He knows by looking at it and just, just looking at it, he can pretty much hit it right in the bullseye. Mm -hmm. But again, all he does is grill. Right? right? He's a grill cutter. So. So, so you can read the book if that's not all you do and it will tell you yeah. what to do. And it gives you these little, even in this book, mm -hmm. it gives you these little paragraphs of what is going to happen when you whip an egg and when you mm -hmm. fold things together. And There's like sections on egg so foam that, yeah. and, and that's varying forms. I think that was my mm -hmm. aha. My aha was, or my stake was, the fact that I can do this. It's not that hard. It's actually pretty easy when you get the pieces together and you read books like this. You realize that it's very simple. There's only a few things happening. And if you can get a grasp of those things as you're cooking, you can go on from one recipe to the next to the next. And within months, I was, like I said, I didn't, no one could give me a job that I was afraid of. I write a column for the Hartford Current, so I get a lot of feedback about recipes and, and how we used to cook better. It wasn't that we cooked better. Well, we did. It wasn't just that we cooked better. It's we cooked the same things. Even my mom, who I think is an amazing cook, she had like, you know, and she cooked a lot. So she had, let's throw, she had 15 recipes. That she knew really And well. let me tell you, yeah. she knocked it out of the park every single time with those mm -hmm. 15 recipes. Right? And mm -hmm. she would throw in a new one every once in a while, and we'd be like, ooh. <laughs> and then, you know, it'd come back again, it'd come back again. And then she would write, she'd get it. And if she got it, it would be 16 recipes now. 
But now the world has opened up to us, and I want to make Spanish food on Tuesday, and next、right. Saturday I want to have a Mexican party, and on Thursday I want to do Italian food. And it, now the whole world has opened up to us. We think we should be able to jump in and just make these recipes. So that's why, but before we didn't need books like this because we just did those recipes over and over again. And by observation and by repetitiveness, we got good at making those. Yeah, it makes me think. So my mother-in-law, who I love dearly, is、um, would have dinner parties. You know, back in the day when everybody had dinner parties, which we all we all go to restaurants like、mm-hmm. Metro Beast now instead. But so she would have dinner parties, and she had I think maybe like four dinner party recipes. And that's all she would ever do, and、mm-hmm. she would, you know, rotate the guests to make sure she didn't, you know, do multiple times for the、mm-hmm. same guests. But、yeah. she could do chicken Kiev, perfect every、yeah. time、mm-hmm. for that exact reason. Yeah, because you made it. She knew how to、time. do it, and、mm-hmm. she'd practice. It's just good. Yeah, and that's. I mean, it is. Pr- it's definitely practice and knowledge too. Like I said, and that's where books like this. And again, it's not just this one. I'll say it again. It's this one. How to read a French fry and what Einstein told his cook. Are you probably, big local? I'm、buyer? probably one of the, and again,、local、I'm probably、products. the one of the chefs that talk about it the least, but do it the most. I mean, I、uh, Holcomb sells somewhere around three to five thousand pounds of vegetables just for me. So、wow. I'm not just buying local food. A、uh, couple like restaurants, you know, we buy our tomatoes from this. You know, I,、right. mean, I in in the height of summer, I go up to ninety percent of my produce coming from two farms. Which is pretty amazing. I mean, then it goes back and forward and stuff. But even through the winter, I mean, I'm still up until last week, two weeks ago, they were picking spinach out of the field for me. That's crazy.、Hmm. Thank God for them, huh? Yeah. But seriously, they're out there and like snipping.、Right. And if you've ever had, you've had spinach grown in the summer. But if you've ever had spinach grown in January, it is nothing like spinach grown in the summer. How does the, it differ? So the so it gets cold. And the leaves shrivel down and almost turn this black color, and they look like they're frozen and freezer burnt and、mm-hmm. dead. And that's when you wake up in the morning, you go out, and all the spinach is dead. But by the time the sun warms it up, the leaves come back to life. They open up again, and they actually get thicker and hardier because they're struggling to stay、mm-hmm. alive. And they're actually they get so thick and so juicy. That I can't even explain the taste to you. It's like spinach on steroids. Wait till the spring. They overwinter parsnips, so they actually stay in the ground, frozen solid, all the way through till the spring. And then, as soon as the ground thaws and the snow is gone, she harvests them, and they're like candy.、Hmm. You roast them, and they get golden brown, and they're so sweet. It's like eating candy. Do they still have the same parsnip flavor? Yeah, but more sweet and more creamy. They're like nothing. Again, they're like nothing you've ever. It's not like you've ever had a parsnip.、Hmm. Yeah, I think that's the cool thing about. I mean, we were just we were just sitting in the kitchen eating carrots the other day, and we just kept eating them, going, you know, you would you wouldn't eat junk food if carrots tasted like this. But yeah, you go to the supermarket and, yeah, and you、so、eat a carrot, and you're、bland. like, yeah, it's a carrot. Yeah. And if you cook it, you're like, yeah, it's a carrot. But these we just kept eating, and、uh, I don't know. Five、so、minutes、sweet. later, I had eaten three carrots. When was the last time you ate three carrots? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to eat three carrots. They、right. were just so, they just good, so good that I wanted to eat three carrots. Maybe that's why it's hard to get our kids to eat vegetables. We need to go to Holcomb Farm and get good vegetables. I think you know what that is. That is exactly <laughs> it. When my mom said she wanted us to eat vegetables, she took us to the garden. Yeah. And she told us, "Don't,、pea. don't touch that." Yeah. Oh. <laughs> And it、Mine. was like peas. It was peas. Like they're not ready、yeah. to eat. Don't even go over there. So my brother and I would sneak over there. You'd start opening the peas, and we'd leave them on the vine. And you'd <laughs> like open the pea, pull out the peas, and close them back up, and then eat them. <laughs> right? <laughs> But the, I mean, we never. You could, I mean, we would. Ne- if she put peas on a plate, yeah, they were green.、Them. We were、yeah. boys. Never would have touched them. <laughs> right. I buy. I buy local eggs from a local farm. And I did up until、uh, my health inspector came in and said we weren't allowed to anymore. We had to buy them from USDA inspected facilities, and that you know people can buy eggs at a local farm, but restaurants can't. So I stopped. And I'm not lying when I say this. It was three or four days later. The USDA inspected <laughs> egg farms got thousands of people sick in this area. <laughs>、oh, <laughs> so I was like,、up. you know、yeah. what? Close me down. Right. I'm buying local eggs because no one's ever got sick from a Fleming egg.
Yeah. It's just not, no. It's just, but it's again, that's one of those weird, you know. So, so now I'm now I'm all set. If they do come to me, I'm like, you mean I can get the chicken but not the egg? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So they can't say. I mean, again, but it's not in the legislature, which is odd. But you know, now the government works. It's not in there yet that we can get the eggs. The local farms do much right. better than these big commercial farms that are that where all these outbreaks are coming from. I mean, the, the health yeah. inspector actually told me to take spinach off the menu a couple summers ago. I was like, it's from Holcomb Farm. I said, the spinach that's killing everyone or getting everyone sick yeah, from California. Right. <laughs> you don't need recall. It, no one got sick from Holcomb Farm. And she's like, no, we're not. So I'm like, I'm not throwing the spinach away. I refuse. Huh. The government. <laughs> Crazy. Well, I guess now we have the faces, safest food system in the world. So we can't criticize too much, right? Right. So, but we can lighten it up a little, I think. Right? Chefs have become very much celebrities. So what, why do you think it is that, that we're so um, intrigued? I have no idea. Chefs? Do you have people that nothing. are just like, I mean, no, I, I, nothing? You know, I do it because yeah. I love being able to take what I know, boil it down, and give it to people to cook at home because cooking at home is the answer to all our health issues and all our, yeah. right? Because that's, if you can cook wholesome food, we can knock out all those things that are struggling mm -hmm. us in our health as far as food in one shot if we all cooked at home. And how do you get people to cook at home? Give them recipes they can make mm -hmm. and, and, and make it so they're proud of what they made and give them the confidence to take that recipe and do something else with it. So what are your thoughts on nutrition and cooking? For example, carcinogens in grilled meat, or heavy cream in recipes, um, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, we all struggle. <laughs> Fat just tastes better. Yeah. I, w but you know what, part of it goes with that. Like, and this goes back to growing food that tastes good. I mean, y the f processed food community wins. Yeah. They do, because I tell this, uh, the one example I'll use is Kraft macaroni and cheese. You can't say it doesn't taste good. You can say you don't like it. You can say it's got chemicals in it. You can say whatever. But they had teams of people <laughs> working to make that stuff taste good. And I can, will even as a chef tell you, it doesn't taste bad. It, it's not my liking, and I know it's got funky stuff in it, but I can go like this and go, this doesn't taste bad, because it's engineered not to taste mm -hmm. bad. Right? And I think they win. So if we take our food and we make it more fresh and more healthy, it, better tasting like those carrots, we can fight that. This isn't the issue. You know what the biggest issue is? Portion size. Mm -hmm. I got crucified for taking my steak down to eight ounces. Jeez. Crucified. I'm not changing. I don't know. It's eight ounces, a half a pound. <laughs> Would you feel better if I said half pound? Because uh, it used to be 12 no. ounces. And I was just like, that's just, no, that's three quarters of a pound. Yeah. Half a pound isn't too much. You're supposed to eat this, you're this much. That's a four ounces. Four ounces yeah. <laughs> that's a quarter pound. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so again, portion size. What is your experience with people's level of understanding how to cook in general? Or do you, the what one type thing, of people You know what, you the teach? one thing I find people miss more than knowledge is confidence. Hmm. And that's the one thing I try to give people when I show them how to do a recipe. The point is that, Cooking is fun. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be easy. It's supposed <laughs> to be done with a frying pan and family. I mean, uh, every Sunday we cook. We, ha we have a dinner club. And every Sunday we cook. And it's just a bunch of us that get together. And we don't talk about any ingredients or where. It we just have a great time. Everyone asks me, what's the best meal? And what's the best restaurant I've ever eaten? And, and, and I can tell you right now, I've eaten in the best restaurants in the country and some of the best in the world. And some of the best meals I've had, it's not about the restaurant or the food. It's about who I was eating with. Yeah, and the true. absolute wild yeah, fun we had at the dinner right. table, you know, almost getting kicked out of places because we were so loud laughing. Yeah. Right? And that's what it's supposed right. to be. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank, Thank you, you, Chris, so much Thank for you. coming.